very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Deltan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Urban Solutions Sustainability R&D Congress 2023 Science of Cities Symposium. My name is Kikuzawa from the Center for Livable Cities, and I will be your MC today. In our first panel session today, titled Science-Based Approach to Future Scenario Planning, this panel will address how a systems-level science-based approach can help reduce uncertainty by identifying the key underlying drivers of the urban system and its emergent behaviours and help understand the co-evolution of different systems and lastly, to consider plausible future scenarios of cities. Without further ado, may we now invite our guest of honour, Mr. Dao Tan, Acting Deputy CEO, Chief Planner of the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore to deliver the opening address to start today's symposium. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Del Tan. Good morning, everyone. Um, very warm welcome to the Science of Cities Symposium. It's my pleasure to share some thoughts on the need for science to help us plan in a complex and uncertain environment and the importance of bridging the science and policy interface. In Singapore, we take land use planning for our city very seriously. This is because of our context. We're a small city, uh, island state with many different needs to accommodate, from housing to commerce, industry, greenery, and sea space needs. Many of these needs will continue to evolve as we undergo demographic transitions to become an aged society, and as our economy matures and our economic structures also shift. So we also have to address rising aspirations from the population and ensure that our land use planning can provide the flexibility to cope with all these future emerging needs. Planning has become more complex because our urban challenges often involve multiple stakeholders with diverse and sometimes conflicting objectives. The urban challenges can also unfold with uncertain trajectories that could lead to a range of potential outcomes and trade-offs. Given these challenges, it's important that our land use planning and development be guided by a better understanding of the city and its entire web of interactions. In this complex and uncertain environment, our planning needs to cater for near to medium term needs and yet preserve options for the future. For example, in the most recent round of our long-term plan review last year, URA took a new and less deterministic approach to evaluate our planning strategies and navigate future uncertainties. This involved moving away from a single deterministic long-term plan to one that plans for options and possibilities um, as we look ahead. We took the perspective that there are actually multiple pathways and a whole range of possibilities that may materialize in future. And it would be very unwise to just plan for one uh, outcome. So our long-term plans cater space for plans to be adjusted as trends pan out. Uh, we do this through reserve sites and future development areas that we set aside that will give us flexibility into the future. But we must also deepen our understanding of the critical drivers of change and to cope with the accelerating pace of change. And this is something that was also mentioned yesterday in the discussions about how things are not linear. Things actually are changing at an accelerating rate. For example, Modeling and simulation can help us generate scenarios to optimize across multiple needs, identify robust planning strategies that are no regrets across different scenarios, and plan for flexibility in the future. Simulating what-if scenarios and planning for, for this sort of flexibility can give us uh, insights on the interactions between factors and probe the possible trajectories that may unfold. So URA is developing a research and innovation strategy to cohere the use of 
modelling and simulation technologies in urban planning and design. So I encourage you to visit our poster to the exhibition, which is in the exhibition area for more details. With increasing expectations from our population, and a stronger, there's a stronger interest to bolster health and well-being in our city. So we'll need to build up our understanding on what makes a good quality living environment for people. And what are the factors that impact their well-being? For example, there's currently a knowledge gap in the determinants of health and well-being outcomes and the relationship between the built environment and health. We'll need to conduct scientific research to build up our basic understanding on the significance of the built environment as a factor in health and develop indicators to measure this relationship. URA has recently launched a grant call on the relationship between the built environment and our mental well-being. The baseline understanding from this research can then help us better plan and design our city to improve well-being. Besides health and well-being, there are also other complex challenges that Singapore is tackling and which require holistic and scientific research. For example, Singapore is on a decarbonisation journey committed to achieving net zero em emissions by 2050. But the pathway to decarbonisation is not a straightforward process. We need to tackle the diverse sources of emissions, such as from buildings, industry and transportation. We also need to have models, data and accounting frameworks for stakeholders to monitor the progress of reducing these emissions. All these demand innovative solutions and transformative policy frameworks, which must be informed by scientific and evidence-based research. And this is why we're here, right? There's also a growing realization that it's not enough to be sustainable. Cities must develop the capacity to regenerate and restore their natural ecosystems while meeting urban development needs. This involves thinking about how materials may be reused and kept in a circular loop, or how renewable energy may be integrated with developments. This Science of Cities Symposium is curated to showcase recent developments in research and to discuss issues related to these complex long-term challenges. Through the panel sessions, researchers and practitioners will share their methodologies and insights to help us think about these complex issues more holistically. On day one of the Congress, we heard at length about the importance and challenges of materializing the value of research through implementation or market deployment. In the same way, it's crucial for us to think about how we can better bridge the science and policy interface in our respective roles. Research can inform our policy and planning strategies, be it at the land use planning, implementation or review stages. As practitioners, our planners want to tap on the expertise and energy in the research community to grow our collective knowledge and to de develop solutions to the real challenges that we face. In that regard, effective communication and collaboration between scientists and urban practitioners is key. This entails creating platforms just like this symposium, where researchers can share their findings in a way that is accessible to policymakers, and where policymakers can articulate their needs and their burning questions to the research community. Such exchanges can help foster alignment between policymakers' research priorities and scientists' expertise. But we recognize that bridging this science and policy interface can be a really long haul process. It's not something that will come overnight. Increasingly, it's not enough to just have interdisciplinary research across sectors or institutions, though that is important. Involving different stakeholders is an important part of the scientific process to narrow the gap between science and policy. Critical in this process 
is to build up our manpower and technical capabilities to grapple with complex and uncertain issues. As a research ecosystem, we need agencies, researchers, and research funders to consistently invest in talent building and retention. <coughs> research on complex issues may not be immediately translatable into concrete outcomes. So we need continuous research to develop all these complex models, build up knowledge of the critical factors that drive our various outcomes in very complex systems, and to sharpen our understanding of second or third order effects arising from each policy action. By nature of all this complexity, it's also not realistic for one research project to provide all the answers that we might ha uh, have questions on. Some research may also need to be phased over a longer period of time to incrementally improve our understanding of complex issues. So we need to think then about how we can articulate and measure the value of this kind of research that will take a long haul to guide our research efforts for the long term. So with all these considerations in mind, I'm happy to note that several of the presenters today will share with us their modeling and simulation research for emerging urban issues. This is a good start, and I hope to see further conversation between researchers and agencies on how the research could be further built upon or integrated into the strategic planning and operational workflows to help us plan and design our city better. Our efforts to understand and tackle complex issues in a scientific and holistic way is a continuous journey. We have a close-knit research ecosystem networks with renowned institutes overseas, and a good foundation in modeling and simulation built up over the years of collaborative research. I hope that we can leverage on these foundations and move towards a stronger integration between science, technology, policy, and planning. Thank you, and I hope you'll find the discussions today stimulating and fruitful for you. Thank you very much, Ms. Adele Tan, for your opening address. Our first keynote speaker for this panel is Professor Long Ying. He is the Associate Professor in the School for Architect in Tsinghua University, Director and Founder of Beijing, Universe, uh, Beijing City Lab. His research focuses on urban science, applied urban modeling, urban big data analytics, and visualizations, as well as future cities. His presentation is titled, Urban Sense, Empowering Communities Through Active Sensing for Sustainable Urban Development. Professor Longing, please. So good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm happy to be here as a member of SOC, CRC, uh, in person here. And actually, today I'd like to talk something about how to collect data. I believe data is quite important for understanding the SDG, for understanding, uh, for promoting uh, urban science, as well as for bridging the so-called urban planning, redevelopment, and the design. So that is the main topic for, uh, for my talk today. Actually, conventional or traditional, how we collect data, how our urban scientists uh, rely, were relying on data to do research. Actually, maybe uh, we can see, for example, yearbooks by the governments, uh, population sensors, and also small-scale uh, questionnaires. They are all the very important data sources for our understanding our cities, physically and socially. And actually, I believe in the past 10 years or 12 years or at maximum 20 years, big data has been very popular in the world among urban planners, urban scientists, actually, for example, mobile trees, uh, records, smart car data from the public transportation system, as well as street view images. But the data I mentioned were not 
derived or produced directly for our understanding cities. Yeah, that, and also the coverage is also to some degree limited and uh, to some degree, to some extent, and uh, so-called outdated, not the most uh, current stage uh, status, I mean. Actually, so my philosophy, my understanding on how to collect data is, I mean, I have proposed the paradigm like urban science, I mean, active urban sensing, I mean, we as urban scientists, planners, designers, redevelopers, for example, go to city space directly to collect data by ourselves. So that is my philosophy for the talk today. And in the framework, maybe we can propose the so-called stationary sensing with fixed locations, like monitoring stations from the environmental department, and also the mobile sensing. We scan the city space by ourselves using carriers like uh, sharing bikes, uh, uh, I mean, uh, trash vehicles, I mean, and also, for example, our uh, taxis as well. And uh, we can also combine both collaborative and mobile sensing modes together to understand, to collect data by ourselves. And in this way, we will be able to understand and to evaluate, to diagnose our built environment, social environment, and natural environment. So it is for all the three dimensions. Actually, when we are talking about the environment, we have three types of environment I mentioned. Actually, we have also scanned the literature to do the systematic review to have a look. I mean, how the very most uh, classical way to measure each indicator for environments. For example, the uh, green exposure, and maybe mobile sensing is very popular and workable, doable for evaluate the indicator. And also for some uh, built environment indicators, I mean so-called mobile sensing is also applicable. So that is our foundation to select the scanning of the sensing mode, mobile, fixed, or collaborative sensing. And we also have the so-called decision tree for helping planners, designers to select the mode. So actually, uh, uh, so it actually generally, since our work is ongoing, not published yet, so it relies on the size of the site and the temporal resolution and the spatial heterogeneity of the variable, for example. For example, the air quality in this room, I mean, maybe it's quite uh, spatially homogeneous. Maybe everywhere the quality is same. But for noise or the voice, volume is quite different and spatially heterogeneous. And for when we are uh, choosing the so-called stationary sensing, one practical and scientific question is how many stations do we need? to have an overall understanding for the environment. That is very important. So it relies on the heterogeneity, the cost, the budget. I mean, monetary budget and the labor force budget. And also the mobile sensing mode. We need to know, I mean, how many hours to fully understand, to complete scanning the environment. And how many agents to scan. And the route planning as well. So, Generally, we need some optimization for both mobile sensing mode and the stationary sensing mode. And in some very, I mean, formal cases, we can also combine mobile sensing and the stationary sensing. In this way, we will be able to have an overall understanding for the environment and for each indicator in three types of environments, for example. And for example, we can set fixed location monitoring stations, and we, we can also uh, deploy robots, for example, or my, myself to scan the room. And uh, alternatively, we can also, uh, I mean, use some other types of carriers. And in the following slide, uh, slides, I'd like to show some applications we have conducted 
uh, in the world and in, especially for uh, uh, in China. For example, in Xining, uh, we have applied uh, the mobile sensing mode and to scan the road network of the whole central city. The total length is around 1,005, I think 1,000 miles. Yeah, so it's, so it's a long journey. And in this way, we will be able to have the most up-to-date look for the built environment to help planners and designers to conduct uh, urban redevelopment work. And we will be able to have an understanding of the vacancies, for example, housing vacancies, commercial vacancies, and also spatial disorder of public space. And the second one is about, uh, I mean, we collaborated with Empirical College London regarding a public health project funded by Wellcome Trust. And in that project, we set up fixed location stations only and fixed for one year and others rotating. For example, one month here and the other following months in other places. And we can have an overall understanding for air and noise quality and conditions in uh, less developed cities in Accra, Ghana. Uh, so here is the, the map we produced. Actually, before the city, uh, I mean, did not have very good uh, established uh, monitoring stations yeah, as a foundation for science. And we can also study the very small scale public space. And we can also check the theory, like uh, William White, Yang Gao, whether their theory is working in practice. And uh, using the CCTV cameras, uh, combined with deep learning algorithms. Uh, here is a map for staying behavior, not transit behavior. And we can also monitor the quality uh, using the mobile sensing in one shrinking city in China. Uh, I mean, where the I mean, monitoring foundation the basis is very poor, actually. So we set up, and also we, can, we also have tried the collaborative uh, sensing modes to combine both fixed location, I mean stationary, stationary location and the mobile sensing together. And in this way, at each time, we can know the indicator value for each location, I mean spatially, temporarily, continuity. So that is our test. I mean, it's our results. It's a field, rather a surface. And I'd like to conclude. I, I just um, propose one framework or paradigm to collect data by ourselves, as a city scientist, as a planner, as a designer, and to understand, to scan, to diagnose, examine our city physically, socially, and naturally. So that is my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Longing, for your presentation. Now, next we have our second keynote speaker for this panel. It's Dr. John Sweeney. He is the UNESCO Chair for Future Studies in Anticipatory Governance and Sustainable Policy Making at the Westminster International University. As a World-renowned futurist, he has organized, managed, and facilitated numerous workshops, seminars, multi-stakeholder projects, foresight games, and simulations in more than 45 countries. Dr. John Sweeney, please. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, it's usually the opposite problem. I'm too loud, so hopefully this will be okay. It's a pleasure to be back in Singapore. I'm very thankful to the URA and the CLC for the opportunity to return and to share a little bit about some of my work. I realize in looking at the session, I'm a bit of an outlier, a bit of a comfortable space for me, but going to be talking about the science of engagement and really try to distinguish a little bit between scenario and foresight practice. So I'll try not to be overly theoretical. But when you call yourself a futurist, it usually helps to focus on concept and theory, not that we're trying to do this. Uh, so I usually set this 
image at the outset of presentations, because this is not what I want to talk about. It's a bit of an occupational hazard, of course, to go around and call yourself a futurist. So my intention in bringing this term forward and talking about futures and foresight in scenarios is to really get away from the crystal ball metaphor, the crystal ball motif, and to really try to understand what I think Singapore has done quite well is how to be intentional, how to be rigorous, how to be critical, creative, and I think most importantly, consistent in how you choose to be anticipatory rather than being reactive. And so again, to be a little bit theoretical, uh, the future is in foresight if we see it as an ecosystem. There's certainly lots of schools of practice and thought that is focused on the actual future. And realize I'm talking to a, a room probably of planners, uh, that's certainly the interest, right? What is the future going to be? Uh, what exactly can and might emerge. And of course, if we think about an inward perspective, either organizationally or even nationally, or the outward perspective, uh, how we're trying to get lots of information and insights, and we just heard a great presentation on this. Of course, no shortage of focus uh, areas on forecasts and models. How do we get hard data? How do we talk to experts? How do we understand that possibility space? And then, of course, plan accordingly. And then, of course, we bring this back into the organization, the institution, strategies, policies, and plans. We initiate organizational change. We focus on innovation. And we try to engage. And this really is the habitus, if you will, of strategic foresight. And again, I think Singapore is a testament to the success of this particular model. Some of the more recent innovations that we've seen is how do we then bring strategic foresight into a space of engagement? I'm going to talk a little bit about that further, but I wanted to highlight just a few examples. Uh, we have seen certainly an increase uh, in different forms of participatory budgeting. Of course, there's an entire citizen assembly movement. Climate assemblies are growing all around the world. And I wanted to call attention to this one because I think it's quite unique and interesting. The City Council of Madrid allocates about 100 million euros to participatory budgets every year. This is not citizen input. This is citizens having a direct say over how and where the money goes and how it's spent. And so I think this distribution and trying to make these processes a bit more horizontal offers some interesting reflections for the kinds of ways that we're bringing the future into our conversations about planning. Another quick example from Poland in the city of Plock, they wanted to look at increasing bicycle infrastructure. So they did what they normally do, send out a bunch of surveys, but then they actually engaged with a local group that designed an online platform and they used a Delphi approach which is an old approach, but uh, they used a, a new digital platform where people could sort of work real time and deliberate. And what they found was that the people who were using the platform to deliberate really uh, connect with each other in meaningful ways. Uh, their inputs and outputs ultimately were a bit more aligned, whereas they received a little bit more of a, a sort of dissensus, if you will, in some of the other inputs that they received. And so I think it's a really good case study, even though it's quite small, uh, it really does bring forward the idea and the opportunity to create different platforms for engagement and what this could potentially lead to. Now, I think the real question that we have to ask is when and how to go beyond the comfortable and familiar strategy policy planning uh, sort of cycle time horizons. Uh, what does it mean if we are asking people to think 30 or 50 years? How do we equip them to do that? How do we ensure that we're not just hitting on the very topical or thematic things, the sort of front page news? Now clearly the, the sort of the, you know, the, the signals uh, can be quite loud and can have a dramatic effect on how people think and feel about the future. And so that's why I think we do need a little bit more intentionality and why I want to spend a little bit more time today talking about transformative foresight. On this side, it's how do we equip citizens? How do we bring forward the mindset and practice more awareness and reflexivity for how we think about the future? How do we instill that in the engagements that we have? And ultimately, how do we find meaningful and productive ways to engage with public images of the future? It can be really terrifying, actually, to go in front of a, of a public or citizens and ask them what are their hopes and fears. In fact, if you're a civil servant, maybe there's nothing more terrifying, the idea like what we might actually hear. And so I think there are some interesting case studies with regards to what this can look like. Now, I've put it on the perceptual side, right? Uh, and it's a bit of a, uh, a challenge to do that. And I'll talk about how to frustrate my own model in just a minute. Uh, for a number of years, I was in Kazakhstan and working with the city of Almaty. And we had a partnership opportunity to help support the master plan. There's a bit of a Soviet legacy in planning. So what they do is they post a 500-page document online that nobody reads. Uh, 
Uh, they have online sessions where the oldest 10 men in the room stand up and speak for an hour, and then the session's over and everybody goes home. So to be able to bring foresight to that conversation and to be able to have a little bit more of a grassroots approach, I think was a, a really a dynamic change. And specifically to go into communities and to actually have them model what they think the future of the city can and might be was a pretty radical turn. Now, of course, this might not be radical in a lot of contexts, including Singapore, but certainly for Kazakhstan and the city of Almaty, the, the former capital, uh, it was really quite dramatic. And it really brought more engagement and actually was really quite interesting with regard to the types of priority areas that emerged. Another example, and you likely have heard of this, is Future Design, which came out of Japan, uses role play. So you actually role play as a citizen from the future. And the participants that did Future Design had more transformative proposals. So there's a real case for actually using games and simulations, which I use quite extensively in my research, but also in my consulting practice, and often blended between the two, uh, to be able to bring this forward. And so I think it's a really dynamic model, and as you can see here specifically, it's being implemented uh, across different uh, parts of Japan, including the, the uh, establishment of a future design office uh, in the city of Yahaba. And I think most interestingly, it's how can this be scaled? So we're looking at actually and talking to people about what might this look like to run future design sessions across the US with the support of uh, some local institutions. And so for me, this really raises the question then, what's the role of culture and context in assessing approach and outcome? How do we think about multi-scale approaches? Are we helping citizens learn and think about the future? Are we building capacity? Are we establishing trust, and how can we think about not just getting data, harvesting it, but sort of the, the mutuality of the process of living, of course, together and planning for a very uncertain future? And so again, I think this is the, the more technical aspect, uh, but really they're overlapped, right? Clearly in practice, we know that we have to engage with communities. And so for me, it's about being more intentional and really trying to seed those spaces of, of transformative foresight. I participated in a research project just a few years ago with a group called the Global Swarm. We were funded by Nesta, a UK social innovation agency, and we found about 300 examples of these participatory futures projects from all around the world. The map is still active. It only has, I think, about 60 or 70 on there, and I'll share the report uh, with you as well. But it's really interesting the degree to which we've seen a massive uptick in these types of approaches, more participatory, asking people about hopes and fears and really trying to stretch that possibility space and create more dynamic engagement. I won't be belabor this, but of course we use that data set to then ultimately synthesize what we saw as the main approaches. Uh, of course, lots of hybridity and different approaches. I'll talk about one uh, just, well, I only have a minute, so I probably won't talk about it too much. But when I was working inside the Red Cross Red Crescent as the Global Futures and Foresight Coordinator, we developed a game about the future that was played on WhatsApp. We had 4,000 players from over 120 countries in six languages providing inputs. It was the largest engagement the organization had ever had. And this is an organization that has somewhere between 11 and 14 million volunteers globally. So pretty dynamic if they were trying to get away from surveys. Uh, I won't belabor this as well, but happy to share the slides, but really intentional with different modes of participation. I think we're very comfortable typically with large-scale engagements with a curatorial approach, but how do, might we think about more constitutive modes of, of participation? So participation where the actual outcome is maybe uncertain and the participants themselves are helping to shape that. And this is the report that chronicles a good bit of that research, and of course the aim is to kind of break institutions out of the eternal present. I don't think that's a specific challenge here in Singapore. Uh, but ultimately how to get away from this model of being uh, reactive and ultimately anticipatory. And in lots of the context I work, that is a significant issue. So really it's about how can we design more inclusive, imaginative, and impactful participatory futures engagements. And I look forward to discussing that with you through the, the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much again, uh, Dr. John, for your presentation on participatory futures. Next, we have our speaker, um, Dr. Tai Chen Yi. Dr. Chen Yi is a postdoctoral researcher at FCL Global, Semantic Urban Elements Team. Her research interests lie in the interface of computation, AI, and urban design. Her presentation today is titled A Case-Based Search Engine for Mapping Urban Patterns and cases integrating street view imagery. 
Dr. Tsai, please. Good morning, everyone. So, I'm Chen Yi, and um, I'm postdoctor researcher from Future Cities Lab. And today I'm going to present my work, a case-based urban search engine, and it is a co-work with uh, Dr. Peter Hedhox and Professor Dr. Bell Lee. So, as we all know that cities are very complex with multi-dimensional aspects, like including landscape, building, people, and so on, and we have multiple ways to look at the cities, including images, models, text, and so on. So, when we go to urban design, urban designers rely on case-based understanding to develop design approaches, while urban scientists search for general patterns that apply across unique cases. So in order to address the complex issues in cities, we need approaches that tightly couple our advances in urban design and science, in case-based reasoning and pattern detection. So on one hand, we need evidence-based design, and on the other hand, we need design-based evidence. To narrow down a bit, so we aim to create the link between specific cases and the overall, overall pattern of various cases. Therefore, we developed a case-based search engine. So in this study, we take the uh, whole city of Nanjing from China as an example. So let's look into the cases in Nanjing. And in our uh, case-based search engine, designers can uh, like find case-based patterns. So I will introduce the case-based search engine from a, a simple search of a single data type to a little bit more complicated search with multiple data types. So uh, first of all, users can use the search engine to uh, search for cases with uh, similar proportions of visible elements, such as roads, buildings, vegetation, sky, and so on. And users can use, simply use the sliders to uh, define what proportions of what they look for. And in addition to images, 3D models are integrated as well. So users can search for cases with similar plot shapes by simply input the geometry of the site shape and then 3D models are given. So apart from the single search by uh, one data type, our search engine also allows for the combination search by multiple data types. For instance, you see here is a combination search of geometry and street view. So users can search for cases of similar plot shape and street view appearance. Um, so, and this search engine allows users to navigate among existing cases to, uh, through the lens of, let's say, desirable or less desirable characteristics. Hence, it can support case-based reasoning in urban design. And now let's look at a user story to show how can we work with a search engine. For instance, now designer A might use a search uh, engine to search for rectangular plots with gre good greenery, and those might be search uh, designer A's inputs, and uh, designer A might be interested in these cases that are, are labeled here. And at the same time, designer B might do the same search, but looking for examples of streets with good enclosure. And then imagine that uh, both A and B have certain assumptions or hypotheses about which characteristics make a particular urban design case good or bad. And through the recursive search and feedback and interaction with the case-based search engine, both of them can uh, reason and learn from the searched cases. And in the end, search A might support assumptions, search B might contradict them. So it really depends on uh, which characteristics are of interest to the designers and planners. And this is another example 
of combination search, which, which is a combination of spatial and street view. Imagine that A might look for cases with narrow streets and old residential buildings, and B looks for cases with semi-open space uh, where there might be a park on one side of the road and significant amount of greenery. So this might be their input of the ISOVIT special characteristic and then search engine for step one gives out the street corresponding street views and then they can select what they want to look into more as a, a input for step two. And like again, the search engine gives out the corresponding cases and again, they can select the cases that of their interests. So now uh, let's look at a little bit then how it works. So our workflow automatically collects uh, urban semantics, spatial and imagery data, including street views, spatial elements that are extracted by applying ISOVIT analysis, uh, satellite images of the plot, and even the 3D building and plot outlines are extracted. So then we, the search engine automatically uh, extracts and analyzes geometry and image data through machine learning. For instance, we apply semantic segmentation technique to the street view uh, images and to extract uh, nine. So here the image you see color codes 19 visible elements, including skies, roads, and so on. And then the 19 semantic elements have different proportions for each of the sample. And here you see the overall distri distribution of the uh, elements for all the samples. Like approximately we have 40,000 images. So how we link and how we map. We map the links between general patterns and specific cases by training several uh, self-organizing maps, SOMs. We call them urban dictionaries. So now you see urban spatial dictionaries, urban perceptual dictionaries, urban street view image dictionaries, and so on. And it is worth mentioning that the map or the dictionary are not only the static image that are visualized here. Actually, in the model, in the map, there are way more similar cases behind each node of the map. That is why we can do the easy search uh, by different data types. And also, please aware that these uh, three ma maps are actually interconnected with each other as well. That is why we can do the cross search with multiple data types as I showed at the beginning. So, um, we work towards data representation, integration, and interoperation in the city context. And we can, with this general framework, computational framework, we can expand this search engine by integrating more data types, domains, themes. And this work I presented is the first step uh, towards a new method to augment the learning and decision-making process of architects and urban designers. And these endeavors are under the Semantic Urban Element Project. And this project, we have multiple uh, expertise from multiple domains. And we are exploring how case-based search can support new approaches linking urban science and design. So that's all from my side for today's presentation. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen Yi, for your presentation. Next speaker, we have Mr. Winston Yap. Mr. Winston is a PhD candidate at the National University of Singapore Urban Analytics Lab. His research focuses on open, soft, open source software, urban machine learning, urban complexity, and network-based analytics. His presentation is titled Urbanity, Automated Modeling and Analysis of Multi-Dimensional Networks in Cities. Mr. Winston, please. Thank you. So I'll just stand here. It's great to be out of the research cave for once. And it's great to meet so many new people and see uh, so many familiar faces as well. Uh, I'm Winston Yap, a PhD researcher at the NUS Urban Analytics Lab. And in my PhD, I focus on the 
uh, urban networks and there are opportunities for supporting context-based planning. So in my PhD, um, we are focusing on developing an open source global tool for city scale network analytics. So over the past decade, networks have emerged as a primary object of scientific interest. Networks have been used to model various complex systems across transdisciplinary domains. For example, one of the first applications of networks is in social graphs, where researchers have used social graphs to understand community structure. Similarly, chemical graph models help provide a compact representation of molecular structure. Networks also help to model biological systems, such as the human brain, and dissimilar representations in artificial neural networks. Examples of networks that are closer to the real world include bibliographic citation networks and transportation networks. So, SHREEDs are one of the most common ways of representing urban networks. And SHREEDs form the basis and backbone of urban connections and help to connect different urban components with one another. However, real-world SHREED networks often lack useful geospatial information that limits their potential to support context-based planning. For example, open street map networks usually only contain attributes such as the given length of a road or the number of lanes. Recent advancements in urban analytics research provides exciting opportunities to bring relevant geospatial information into urban networks. And context is important for cities because cities are complex systems. Cities consist of social, economic, infrastructural, and environmental components that interact dynamically with one another. Planning for such systems require holistic systems-based approaches. For example, if we are looking at active mobility, population information such as where people live whether streets are friendly for walking and cycling, as well as information about the amount of urban amenities reachable in an area are crucial. So in this context, our goal is to develop a lightweight and accessible solution to enable large-scale modeling on city networks. The Urbanity Project is an open source Python package developed at the NUS Urban Analytics Lab to facilitate and enable rapid and scalable generation of feature-rich urban networks across any geographic location and scale. Our software is easy to use. Our users simply input a shape file, and the software uses the boundaries to extract useful geospatial information across various open data layers and integrate them into urban networks. So our software computes more than 40 urban indicators, integrating them into network nodes and edges. The figures on the left show some descriptive use cases, visualizing urban population density distributions across Paris and Tokyo. On the right, we visualize image visual complexity across cities. Image visual complexity is an indicator which measures the amount of visual information in an urban scene. It is useful for understanding the imageability of a place, as well as assessing traffic risk conditions. This figure shows a brief overview of our data processing pipeline. We employ algorithms to simplify network topology and ensure that building footprints are valid. And we also adopt a consistent and open schema to relabel points of interest according to common categories. We employ a deep learning computer vision model to extract visual indicators from street, street view imagery. And last but not least, we obtain high resolution population density maps through Meta's Data for Good portal. So aside from the software, we also built a global network data set and dashboard spanning 50 cities across 29 countries. 
Uh, this work was recently published in the journal Scientific Data. Users can use the dashboard to analyze how different network indicators compare across cities. And aside from the global view, they can also deep dive into network individual cities. And the top left panel shows how we can look at the linear association between feature pairs. So for example, looking at uh, intersection density on the y-axis and building footprint on the x-axis, we see a positive relationship, which is not surprising because places with more roads tend to have more buildings as well. And for the bottom panel, it allows users to deep dive into the network to examine its structure and attributes. And users can also conduct grid level analysis across any of the 40 attributes and data layers that are computed through the software. So aside from descriptive use cases, we can also use network indicators for predictive and analytical tasks. For example, this figure uses network assortativity to examine patterns of urban greenery segregation in Singapore. So network assortativity is a metric proposed by Mark Newman, which measures the similarity between connected locations. And in this case, we can see that urban greenery is highly homogenous across Singapore, reflecting the success of early city greening efforts. And aside from individual cities, we can also look at different cities and compare them and their subzones. This scatter plot shows on the y-axis uh, intersection density in an area, and on the x-axis mean building complexity, which has a lower value if the area has uh, building shapes that are more simple. So the, each subzone is also color-coded according to the city that they belong to. And we can see some interesting patterns. For example, the central cluster for Paris uh, are very homogenous, and we can see that it's because of the long history of centralized planning in Paris. As for Singapore, there's large variance, and this makes intuitive sense as well, since Singapore as a city state without a hinterland has to balance diverse land use requirements. Urban network indicators can also be used to build more expressive graph uh, geo AI models. So in this case, we implement graph neural networks across different cities to predict road category. And road category is important since it helps to, it enables us to understand traffic speed, pollution, and noise. So the figures show that the model performs consistently well across different cities and adds to the usefulness of contextual indicators for urban machine learning models. So this brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. We are the Urban Analytics Lab, and we look forward to connecting with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Winston. Next, we have uh, Dr. D Dr. Heiko. Dr. Heiko is the head of the Digital Twin Lab and at the Singapore ETH Centre and the lead investigator in the Cooling Singapore project. His research focuses on modelling, simulation, high-performance computing and cloud computing. His presentation today is titled Digital Urban Climate Twin of Singapore to Analyze Green Plan 2030 Scenarios. Dr. Heiko, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So um, today's uh, presentation is about uh, the Digital Urban Climate Twin. I'm going to give you a quick introduction about what it is, and then in the context of what we do with the Green Plan 2030 is one of the case studies that we use um, uh, to, to use for the Digital Urban Climate Twin. Um, the work is done uh, for the Cooling Singapore project. Some of you have already heard about it. It's a collaboration between the Singapore ETH Center, uh, Cambridge Cares, NUS, SMU, SMART, and also TUM Create. Um, some of you are probably already very familiar with the Green Plan, but i just um, give you a quick rundown of it. Um, what is the Green Plan 2030? Um, it's a whole-of-nation movement 
to address Singapore's national agenda on sustainable development. So there's a whole number of ministries and agencies involved. Um, and was it, what does it plan to achieve or what does it seek to achieve is to strengthen the uh, Singapore's commitments uh, to the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals as well as the uh, Agenda and Paris Agreement. Uh, it's also to position Singapore um, at, uh, to achieve its long-term net zero emissions aspirations by 2050. And there's a whole, there's a whole list of targets and very concrete measures that the Green Plan actually tries to achieve and do. And I've just listed some of the examples uh, which you can find a lot more information on on their website, actually. Uh, one of them is to plant a lot of trees, basically increase vegetation, quadruple solar energy development by 2025, reduce the waste of uh, sand to landfill, and a whole number of others. Now, the Cooling Singapore project is really about the uh, urban heat island, outdoor thermal comfort, and what we really ask ourselves is, and that's sort of how it started off, how can we help planners to better understand how implementing new plans, such as the Green Plan 2030, what would this mean for the, for the city, in, in our case for the urban climate, what's the impact? And ultimately, um, we would like to support them with tools so they can make better informed decisions about the urban climate. And the way how we do this is basically by building a digital urban climate twin. And the idea of it would be then that the practitioners can use it to run what-if scenarios. And that would help them to better understand potential implications of one plan or the other. Now, um, what is a digital urban climate twin? Um, it's basically a digital representation of the, of the city and all aspects that are relevant to the urban climate. So that involves, of course, uh, urban climate models, but it also involves a number of models for anthropogenic heat emissions, such as uh, we have building energy models specifically for the air conditioning, we have transport models for uh, the heat that's being emitted by the, by the cars specifically, um, there's industry models, there is uh, also power plant models, basically all the major processes that are going on in the city that are also emitting heat into the city. The idea was that we all incorporate this into an integrated uh, federation of models um, so that you would be able to run these integrated scenarios. And then you can ask questions. Well, what would happen if you plant a million trees? What does it mean? Depending on where you plant the trees, you get different results. Uh, what would happen if you switch to electric vehicles? Now, the issue is that the models that are behind the digital urban climate twin, they can be highly complex. And some of you may have already had uh, your own hands-on experience with, in particular, urban climate models. They are fairly complex things, pieces of software. Some of them have to run on supercomputers. There's hundreds of parameters uh, that you need to uh, know about and parameterize your models accordingly. So that's all very technical and all very difficult. Now, of course, planners cannot be expected to be experts with a whole set of models. They cannot be expected to run things manually themselves on a supercomputer. So what we do with the Digital Urban Climate Twin, we actually have developed a user-centric front-end application. We call it the Explorer, the Duct Explorer. <coughs> the idea is that the Explorer application allows its users to explore what-if scenarios. It's a browser-based application, so technically as long as you have an internet connection uh, and a modern sort of modern browser, um, you can run the Explorer and from that parameterize your scenarios, analyze them, um, review the results and also compare with other scenarios that you have run. Now I'll show you a quick video about um, how this is looking like. Um, so yeah, as I said, we, we use the Green Plan as one of the use cases, as one of the examples of how we can apply the Digital Urban Climate Twin. We have a number of um, things that we can parameterize. So for instance, you can set the vegetation uh, levels. You can increase vegetation. What happens if you reduce or increase the vegetation? So we can do that. And we do this by means of so-called local climate zones. Um, we can then also um, uh, work with parameters about urban, uh, sorry, about traffic. So for instance, we can say, well, what happens if we have more electric vehicles or less? It also has impacts on the power plants. More electric vehicles means more electricity consumption, therefore, uh, more heat emissions at the power plants. And then ultimately, of course, you can run the climate simulations and figure out um, under what kind of meteorological conditions 
um, your scenario would perform. So for instance, you can look at a heat wave scenario or a cold spell scenario, certain uh, uh, seasons in Singapore and see how your scenarios uh, also compare with each other. So for instance, you can plan, uh, you can set out mitigation scenarios and then simulate the difference. So it basically allows you to look into all these different scenarios, simulate them, create the data, and of course also export this data later on and um, uh, work with the tools that you're already using and are comfortable with. Um, just some preliminary, preliminary findings. Um, the first thing that we've looked at is actually looking at the building stock, uh, the built environment, because that actually cr uh, contributes quite a bit to the urban heat island. Um, so just buildings in a passive way uh, can, up, uh, can contribute with up to 3.7 degrees. Um, and if you add air conditioning, that adds another 1.4 degrees. Um, so that's quite significant. So for instance, making air conditioning more energy efficient or using district cooling uh, would help to mitigate some of these efforts, uh, uh, some of these measures. Uh, the other thing is traffic. I mentioned this earlier, what happens if we uh, switch to electric vehicles? Um, and in fact, that can also make uh, a difference of up to uh, 0 0.9 degrees during uh, uh, peak hours um, and at least 0 0.1 degrees um, uh, to a mean reduction. Uh, over 24% of Singapore's land area, which is uh, significant still. Um, how do we continue? Now, the thing is we developed this Explorer app for end users, right? So not for necessarily for researchers and technically minded people, but really for planners and decision makers. So what we're trying uh, to do now actually within uh, this quarter and also the beginning of next year, run guided uh, sessions with potential user groups and to see how actually can we change this Explorer app to make it more relevant and more interesting for um, the end users to, to, to be really relevant and useful to them. Because we really want to figure out where can we bring in our tool so that you can make better decisions. The second thing is we are adding support for more use cases. So as we speak with potential user groups and figure out new problems, interesting case studies, interesting uh, use cases, because again, we want to figure out where can we make a difference, a positive difference with our application. And the other thing that we're doing, um, and that I think is something that needs to be mentioned as well, is that um, it comes out of research, and uh, typically in research we work on prototypes and perhaps proof of concepts, but the Digital Urban Climate Twin is really, uh, we're aiming for a technology readiness level of six and above um, by the end uh, of August 2024. So it's more than just a prototype. Thank you very much, um, and I'm looking forward to questions um, in the panel session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Heiko, for your presentation on the Digital Urban Climate Twin. Next speaker, we have Mr. Dick Wu. Mr. Dick is a Master Researcher at the Physics Department in the National University of Singapore. His research focuses on complex systems, in particular complex network research. His presentation is titled today, Analyzing Systemic Traffic Conditions in Singapore Through Epidemic Spreading Model. Mr. Dick, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Wu Dake from the Physics Department of NUS, and I'm very excited today to be here to share with you my recent works on using an epidemic model to study the Singaporean traffic congestion. So we know that there are some researchers looking at the traffic system from a microscopic scale. They can look at each individual drivers or individual vehicles to tell us, okay, what is the congestion? Is the congestion happening? And on the other hand, we have some macroscopic metrics to tell us what's the overall congestion level or resilience level for a city. But today, what we're lacking is a bridge between the two, between microscopic and macroscopic, to tell us some mesoscopic information, like if there is a small congestion, what is the probability that it will expand or spread to a larger scale? And if it does, what would be its size, or duration. These things are quite essential when we are talking about urban resilience. However, in order to build such a bridge, purely statistical method might not be enough. That's because actually the nature of the spreading and recovery of the congestion is dependent on many complexities. And those complexities are subject to change 
when our city is developing. So today, what I would like to share with you is how we tried to build this model. We want this model to be able to estimate, or say to predict, the congestion level and resilience level in an explainable way. Thus, the predictability of our model can remain even if our city is undergoing changes. So what we actually want is a well-parameterized dynamical model. So there are some researchers uh, looking at the traffic problem using the SRR model. The SRR model was originally developed to help us understand the the spreading of an infectious disease in a population. That model classifies all the individuals into three types, S, I, and R standing for uh, susceptible healthy people, infected patients, and the people recovered and have immunity to the disease. So the fraction of these three types, their time in evolution can be described by a set of equations, and the solutions to the equations can look like, can look like what's on the right. So you know, in reality, during a pandemic like COVID, it's sometimes unavoidable that uh, the majority of our population will eventually be infected for at least once. But what we can do is to slow down the infection and accelerate the recovery. So this is what we call the flatten the curve. This will lower the peak value of the fraction I. So thus we can prevent our medical system from breaking down. And our traffic context, the traffic problem is quite alike. It can be fit into the model quite well that the road or road segment or area of road segments before or without congestion is S. And those under congestions are I, and those recovered from congestion after the like morning peak or afternoon peak are R. So what we can do is still the flatten the curve. Like when we're talking about traffic resilience, it's nothing but to reduce the happening, the infection of the congestion, and to accelerate the recovery of the congestion. So this is nothing but also flatten the curve. So uh, we know that it's good to use SR model to look into the traffic congestion. But you see, the fully mixed, the two words here, this means uh, the model does not have an internal structure. So in the fully mixed model, one individual can spread the infection, the disease, to any other individual. But this is not actually the case in reality, because especially in our traffic context, there is a ge geographical structure. So what we really need is a network SR model. In the network model, all the individuals are represented by the nodes in the network, and they are connected by some edges. And the infection, the disease, can only spread from one individual to another through a link, like what's shown in the left. Uh, we have two individuals put together, like two, two people or two, two roads. The top one is congested, like a, a patient and the bottom one is uncongested, like uh, healthy people. So at the, time, at the next time step, the next moment, uh, the upper one will have a chance to recover itself, and it also have a chance to infect the other one. Such a network model respects the topological or say geographical structure of our system. So compared with the fully mixed model, we can expect it to better describe the behavior of our congestion or recovery. Why is uh, 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 trying to study the, 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 the con congestion using the SRR model so interesting to me? One very important reason is that uh, the spreading of disease in a network is equivalent to a percolation process. In physics, the percolation theory tells us if a network, in a network, the nodes are connected, or the edges are opened by a probability called the percolation rate P, then there will be some, let me play the video. There will be some small clusters, or say, components uh, emerging. And these components, in our context, just represents the connected, congested area of our city. So when P, the population rate, is increasing, the size of these clusters will also increase. And when P reaches a certain critical value called the population threshold, suddenly, a very large area of connected, one single joint component will emerge. So in the reality, the case is just the picture on the very, uh, the, the very right. At this moment, almost all of our city are congested, and traveling around the city is impo impossible, and the traffic network becomes not functional. So, uh, in order to tell the overall congestion level of a city, we can just fit this model with our real-world data. 
But before doing so, we noticed that the reality is actually deviating from the model a little bit. Like the model is regarding the recovery of infection as a spontaneous process, which is not dependent on the surroundings. But in reality, it's not. Look at the circle road, which is congested. If all of its three, uh, all of its three outgoing directions are congested, so the drivers in this road will have nowhere to go. But if some of the outgoing directions are free flow, then the drivers can choose to go there, so there will be a higher chance for this road to get recovered. We look into the real-world data of Singapore traffic and try to incorporate this idea into our new model. We propose a new model called the two-type model, uh, two-type SI model. So in this model, we no longer regard the free flow only as a counterpart of the congestion state, but another, another type of disease also spreading on the traffic network and is competing with the congestion. And both of the congested and recovered node will have a chance to infect another, like shown in the diagram on the left. Two, two rows are put together, one is congested, one is uncongested. Both of them will have a chance to spontaneously change state to another state, and both of them will also have a chance to infect the other, making it become congested or free flow too. So we fit this on the real world data of Singapore traffic and found that even in the busiest area of Singapore, uh, the population rate is still much lower than the estimated population threshold. This means in Singapore, even if a car accident would, or whatever thing happens and leads to a small congestion, it's not very likely that it would spread to a larger scale. So, by far, we have built a dynamical model that we can predict uh, the final congestion or resilience level based on a set of dynamical parameters. We hope that in the future, we can use a machine learning model to predict those parameters based on the very fundamental urban planning data. So from urban planning data to the dynamical parameters, and finally to the overall congestion and resilience level, this two-step system can help us to predict the final traffic condition when we are going to change our urban plan. This is very useful if we are going to build some new roads or like issue new car certificates or like uh, uh, build a new bicycle facility or whatever thing. This can be very useful in our future urban plan. So this is all we'd like to discuss about our, uh, about our recent work to you. And there is one of my personal ideas that I would like to share with you, is that how do I try to deal with the urban complexities? It's, uh, the, as a physicist, I would say every system can be examined from very different scales. Like what we usually observe is the microscopic phenomenon, and what we can measure is the very detailed information of the system. And Build a dynamical model to connect the two can be very difficult because we usually see disorder in the very microscopic world. But we can always try to find a scale where we can see order. Like in our traffic context, uh, directly looking at the cars or drivers can be very difficult, and predicting the final overall, overall condition of the system can be difficult just basing on them. But we can choose to look at a road. Or if a road doesn't work, we look at a local network consists of a, a number of roads. So this can make our task easier, as we can see order, and based on the order, we can build a dynamical system. And the dynamical system is more reliable than only statistical models. OK, that's all I would like to share with you today. And I will be at the poster presentation in the afternoon. If you have anything to discuss with me, feel free to find me there. That's all. OK, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Dake, for your presentation on systemic traffic conditions in Singapore. Next, we have our speaker, Dr. Sam Joyce. Dr. Sam is an assistant professor in the Singapore University of Technology and Design. His research focuses on leveraging real-world data to help understand the present and plan for the mid to long-term future. His presentation is titled today, Understanding Active Mobility Using Computer Vision and Data Visualization. Dr. Sam, please. Hi there, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Um, nice to see you all. Um, I'm Sam Conrad Joyce, um, and this is some work that we've been doing um, in collaboration with LKYCIC, um, understanding kind of what's going on at a very kind of micro scale. So it was interesting to see the, the, the kind of accidents and collisions from the previous talk. We're sort of going very, very micro here. Um, so I think as as has been identified, um, active mobility is a very important part of kind of wellness and, and health. Um, 
And globally, we've sort of identified this idea of a 15-minute city. Some people debate whether that should be 20 or 30. Um, but the basic idea is that moving around, um, getting to different places is, is a good idea for our health um, and general well-being. Singapore, um, sort of in arguably in parallel, but also as a part of this kind of active mobility, has, has planned very well for sort of an urban network, the Park Connectors Network. Um, which is specifically orientated less towards getting around a sort of a neighborhood necessarily, but more sort of longer trips. Um, and this network is, is quite, uh, consists quite large and it's getting bigger. We can see there up to sort of 300 kilometers um, of park connector currently in, in Singapore. And the dynamics of these are, are very interesting. They're a sort of a mix of pedestrian and cyclists as well as uh, uh, public mobility devices, or personal mobility devices rather, um, so that typically results in sort of some sort of electric sort of vehicle. However, this uh, sort of use of per personal mobility devices hasn't been perfectly uh, issue free. Um, they're significantly faster than a typical cyclist, they weigh more. Um, and there's been a growing concern kind of especially before kind of 2020 about kind of accidents, which was also shown sort of in the data of, of collisions. Now, since then, there have been various laws put in place to stop people using scooters, e-scooters and things like that on just the regular paths, but they're still allowed in um, uh, park connector networks. And we think this is really interesting kind of new item kind of that exists within the, the kind of built form. And I think there's a really interesting kind of argument for asking questions about what the interaction is between those. This research is also further sort of um, started by the work that we did, uh, again, with LKYCIC on kind of elderly activities. And almost um, uniformly, uh, the, the survey results said that one of the big fears for people walking around was fear of being hit by PMDs and bicycles. So we identify this as a real important thing to work out how to kind of navigate this. And, but I think before that, we need to know how to understand actually what's going on. Um, along those lines, um, we're interested in how to kind of objectively understand how different users um, are using the space. And we don't actually see that much literature or very much data importantly on that. And so our kind of sort of somewhat naive interest is what if we could put a little Fitbit not on people themselves? We think that there's enough kind of CCTV surveillance technology out there. When we sort of did our, our kind of research, we found it was very easy to find somebody, you know, what they'd done somewhere and then find them sort of 20 days in the past and every, every location. However, what we didn't find was that there was very reliable ways of really objectively understanding what's going on in spaces themselves. So our kind of focus here is to kind of understand the space themselves. In, the, in this instance, we're interested in something that's a kind of a generic site. So this is the sort of default park connector connection. But we think that this could be applied both at a sort of you know, individual scale for say, for example, kind of specific kind of accident areas or specific areas of interest, as well as to gain kind of general in, insight into a sort of you know, a specific typology kind of within Singapore or elsewhere. There's a, of course a precedent for this um, with the great work of, of William White, which I think I was, got me excited about moving away from the sort of typical kind of large urban scale work that we do and looking, focusing more on the kind of macro scale. Uh, so with this work, he was able to kind of demonstrate that using kind of what I guess at the time was basic surveillance, sort of uh, Cine 8 cameras, and a lot of uh, handwork to kind of identify where these people were. Every, every movement was identified with a human. Um, we're able to get this kind of really interesting, rich information. So William White was able to show, for example, that conversations almost only ever happen kind of around the piazza, not in the piazza, for example. That's the, the image on the left there. Um, but technology's moved on. Um, you know, it's very easy now to apply kind of machine learning, uh, computer vision to images. Um, we're specifically focusing more on kind of object detection, but you know, you get the idea. So we're interested in kind of applying this um, kind of to get insight into space. And our methodology is quite straightforward. We have the benefit now of these kind of consumer grade cameras. So we can buy simple cameras, quite cheap. They last about three days uh, or more uh, in terms of uh, sort of running on batteries with an, an additional sort of solar panel, so quite good for doing 
kind of initial quick studies on, on various areas. Um, and this is the specific site that we were looking at, uh, a park connector in Tampanese. Tampanese Town Council um, uh, helpfully sort of allowed us to, to survey this. And we're able to do some things where we sort of project it into the 2D um, and then more importantly, gain kind of higher level sort of information for it. So we're still building up a sort of framework to sort of properly understand this. And what we're hoping to do is sort of build a, dash a dashboard that's able to kind of process large amounts of these information to get kind of qu quick kind of uh, insight into this. Um, but what we're kind of currently focusing on is this kind of interaction between the kind of general temporal events. So this is kind of the busyness. Here you can see the blue is um, pedestrians, the, the yellow is, is cyclists, for example. And we can see this kind of high peak of like the commuting periods when people are, wa are walking to the Tampanese station, for example. We can find directionality, we can identify speed, but we can also project this into a spatial environment. Here we're only showing one camera, but we actually had three cameras on site and we're able to kind of overlay that data. Um, so we think this is useful just from the off that we're able to gain these kind of high level uh, identifications of, for example, what is the use of a, P of, a, of a park connector? We see that sort of about one third of all park connectors are, are kind of PMDs of some description. There's an argument for kind of separating those out because you can see some of these people are sort of using wheelchairs and things. Um, I think further work could be done, can done in there. Um, but we're interested in sort of, of, of getting kind of high level understanding of this. Interestingly, we were surprised that there's a lot of people actually using the cycle paths. So we're, our argument is that the bicyclists are actually quite sort of quite good at doing what they're told, whereas the cyclists, the pe pedestrians are not. Um, for example, the PMDs are often quite good at sticking to the speed limit, but we get some people that are going really, really scarily really fast, um, uh, especially kind of, uh, at kind of more open times. And then what we're also seeing are some trends about uh, daytime, nighttime, and the sort of dusk evening effects of pedestrians. Um, and we see very clear identifications of clumping and, and high identification uh, during rain periods. Um, and we collaborated uh, William White's work um, about where people clump and specifically at, at intersections. So that's a very clear thing and I, we think that there's some interesting findings in relation to interaction between cyclists um, and, and pedestrians there. So I won't go into too much of the details, but what we see is this kind of very in, uh, interesting kind of bimodal approach um, in terms of cyclists and pedestrians behaving at dif uh, differently at different times. And we think this is something that's not, um, not well looked uh, at, it, at currently. Um, so we think that when doing planning, it's worth looking at the interaction between day and night time and then the, the difference in the activity for pedestrians and, and um, PMDs respectively. And what we also find is that PMDs go much faster in open areas rather than the more secluded area of, of the bike lane, for example. So I'm gonna click over there because I'm a bit out of time. Um, but we think that this is a kind of interesting way of understanding uh, kind of how to see these spaces. We're following up our work uh, more and more um, to look more at recreation now. So we have an active project with, um, with N Parks looking at recreation and kind of effectively putting the sort of Fitbit on, on parks instead. So we're excited to do that. We also think there's a lot of value in applying this in kind of A-B testing. So doing intervention, seeing what the effect is uh, and, and recording it before and after and being able to identify the real, the real impacts. Um, great, and I want to thank my team, and specifically um, Murky, who's here, uh, Nazim, and also Belinda Yuen, who I work a lot with uh, LKYCIC. Uh, thank you.